Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us on Across the Fence. I'm Julie Whitney. While our over-the-air audience is always near and dear to our hearts, we know that many of you watch online and our social media channels like YouTube and Facebook. Today, we're re-airing one of our most popular videos from 2023, our story about the restoration of the American chestnut. To date, this video has been viewed nearly 14,000 times on YouTube since it aired last December. We began in the field where Keith Silva introduces us to the dedicated men and women of the Vermont and New Hampshire chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. Here's Keith. Tucked away in a back corner of UVM's Catamount Educational Farm in South Burlington is a relic of North America's historical forest ecology, a stand of American chestnut trees. As long as the female flowers have styles emerge, the bags are... The trees are maintained by the Vermont and New Hampshire chapter of the American Chestnut Foundation. Kendra Collins is the director for regional programs and the New England Regional Science Coordinator for the ACF. What we're doing here today is the first step in a controlled pollination process as part of our restoration program. So this is the bloom of an American chestnut tree. Uh, we have both male and female flowers on the same tree. So these long guys that look kind of like a pipe cleaner are the male catkins. And so each of these little bumps along here is actually a teeny little male flower. There's tons and tons of them. They produce a lot of pollen. Then we also have these bisexual catkins that have some male flowers at the tip, but there's also a female flower at the base. And so this little green pineapple you know, is the female burr flower, and it's going to develop into a big spiny burr over the course of the season. The goal here is to inhibit the female flowers from being naturally pollinated by covering them up with paper bags. And what that is doing is preventing pollen from the rest of this orchard from getting on these little guys. Um, or gals, <laughs> and then we can come back two weeks later and actually put pollen that we've selected for a particular purpose onto these flowers and harvest nuts in the fall that are presumably from the cross that we're making. Most of these crosses are designed to breed trees that are resistant to chestnut blight. Once the dominant species in eastern U.S. forests, legend has it that a squirrel could scurry from New England to Georgia on the branches of American chestnuts. That was until the early 1900s, when an airborne bark blight was accidentally introduced to North America through the importation of Japanese chestnut nursery stock. It's estimated this fungus killed between 3 and 4 billion American chestnuts, nearly wiping out the entire population. Some of the trees in the orchard in South Burlington show signs of being infected by blight. For Collins, this is the main purpose for the restoration project. What gets to our volunteers and pulls people in is the chance to help fix something that we as humans kind of broke. After a couple weeks, Collins and her volunteers are back in the orchard. And this time, they've brought pollen. Lots of pollen. This is the actual pollination step. So what we're doing today is we're coming back, we're finding all of the bags that we put on, we're removing them to expose the female flowers that are in there that we you know, very carefully prepared a few weeks ago. And then we're taking pollen from trees of interest that we wanna use for breeding, and we're applying that pollen to the receptive parts of the female flowers. There's a few different pollens we're using today. Some are from a transgenic chestnut program which was developed with genetic engineering and has a gene from wheat that imparts blight resistance onto the trees and onto the offspring of the trees. Once pollinated the bags are placed back on and the rest is left to mother nature. The flower for American chestnut the female flower becomes a big spiny burr and so by harvest time it's usually about the size of a baseball sometimes a little smaller sometimes a little bigger um, and in some cases, there are several female flowers in these bags, so they're going to be ripped open. We actually are going to come back either later today or in the coming weeks and put mesh bags over all these pollination bags so that anything that does burst open is contained and we can make sure to, to collect all those nuts. We're harvesting chestnuts. Over the course of the summer, the female flowers have developed and they look inside the bags just like these burrs on the tree, big spiny husk. Nuts should be inside of those. The spines on the husks are not to be taken lightly. They're very similar to cactus spines. They're very sharp, and they get sharper as they get drier. A dry chestnut burr is not something you want to mess with. Uh, so we usually wear hardy gloves for what we're doing. The bags will be clipped off the trees and brought back to the lab 
where the husks will be shucked, the nuts removed, tested for viability, placed in peat moss, and stored in a refrigerator over winter. A lot of the crosses we're making are for various parts of our, our science program, all of which is ultimately designed to get these trees out into the forest in a manner that they can sustain themselves. Thanks to the efforts of Collins and others, the challenge of restoring the American chestnut hopefully won't be too tough of a nut to crack. In South Burlington, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Thanks, Keith. Back in December, I was joined in the studio by Kendra Collins and Gary Hawley, a local volunteer and former UVM professor. Collins explained how their organization is structured around volunteer state chapters, which range from Maine to Georgia, in the same range as this once mighty species. The structure of the American Chestnut Foundation is kind of unique. We have a relatively small staff. We do have a staff research farm in Southwest Virginia, but most of our work on the ground is actually done by volunteer state chapters. The native range of the American chestnut spread from Maine to Georgia and west of the Ohio River. And so kind of within that space, we have 16 volunteer state chapters covering 20 states. Here in New England, all six New England states are part of that volunteer network. We have a joint Vermont, New Hampshire state chapter and a joint Mass Rhode Island chapter. And so, you know, range wide throughout our whole program, we have over 500 research plantings. Within New England, it's a little over 100. And here in Vermont and New Hampshire, we have a little over 20. Um, they fall into sort of three major buckets. So the orchard at the Hort Farm is a conservation collection. It's all wild type trees that we're really just conserving so that we have access to them. We also have an awful lot of plantings in our network that are part of our work to develop disease resistance, um, primarily to chestnut blight, but also to Phytophthora root rot, which is more of a problem in the southeastern United States. So that's a big place our volunteers help. Uh, and then the last bucket is reintroduction trial plantings, which is actually something that Gary has partnered with us on um, through his work at UVM to start getting at one of the best management practices for getting disease resistant trees into the forest. Like once we have them and we're ready to like Johnny chestnut seed it, like what do we do? How do we do that successfully? And so if we can kind of learn the best practices while we're still developing the right trees, um, we're hoping to be able to you know, hit the ground running a little bit better. And tell me about your crop this year. How did it go? How was the harvest? Uh, it was decent. It was a little variable across the region. So that frost that we had back in May, um, you know, sort of the latter part of May, was hit or miss for chestnuts across, especially New England. Uh, if they were already leafed out, they did fine. It was no big deal. The Hort Farm, no big deal. Those trees were, were already in full leaf. But in places where they were just starting to break bud, the leaves got really hammered, and so did the flower buds. So those trees re-leafed just fine, but the production was down. So, you know, kind of, you know, as all biological systems, there's ebbs and flows. The Hort Farm was fantastic. We got over 3,500 nuts out of that orchard from our controlled crosses and from some open pollinated material that we were able to harvest. You know, nature does a great job of pollinating much better and more efficient than we can. Uh, and then I would say program wide, harvest was probably down a little bit, um, you know, total, but we have more than enough material to support all the programs and projects that we've got in the works for next year. So. We're good. All right, I'm glad to hear it. <laughs> and Gary, you actually recently retired as an, I believe it's environmental science and forestry faculty from UVM. Yes. But tell me a little bit about where your interest in chestnuts began. Well, um, I think part of it is, as you can see, the passion of the, the leaders in the, pro in the American Chestnut Foundation, but also the volunteers working with people. And it's really satisfying to get out there and start to make a difference. But actually, throughout my whole career, there were, um, there were many threats to forests and, and their function that, you know, like invasive plants, um, insects, disease, as well as acid rain and, and climate change. Examples of that might be Dutch elm disease, which killed off many of the American elm and uh, emerald ash borer, which is about to decimate most of the ash in, in this region. Um, my interest in the American Chestnut Foundation is that this is an opportunity to reintroduce a species back into the forest where, where we need it since we're losing so many species, as well as, as I said, the passion of working with, with other people with like interests. Okay, and so based on your experience in forestry, do you think it's possible to reintroduce light fruit? Yeah, it's, it's a long process. As you heard, I think in the video, it, it pointed out the American Chestnut Foundation has been active for about 40 years, and they also have many partners, universities, other research institutions and such. And as it said in the video also, it, there were four billion American chestnut that were killed by the, the blight. And, and, and as Kendra said, the, the range is massive, so to, the thought of reintroducing it everywhere is probably 
just totally daunting. But I, th I think the, um, the fact that we're at a point of about to develop a resistant, uh, chestnut blight resistant individuals is very hopeful to me. And, and I hope within, you know, within the next decade, we're starting to move that out into the field after sure. we kind of do trials and field tests of, of many of the potentially blight resistant individuals. All right, and we'd be remiss if we wrapped up without talking about some of the items we have here. Can you <laughs> briefly tell me a little bit about what you brought? Uh, yeah, so in the center are some chestnut burrs. So that's the husk um, that the American chestnuts grow in, or that all chestnuts grow inside. There's several species of edible chestnuts. Um, and the American is, of course, our, our native. Um, these are the, the smaller nuts over here are the American species. Um, and that's, that's these ones here? Correct. Okay. Uh, and that's what, you know, when colonists first moved to the United States. Um, that's what they found in our forest. That's what indigenous people had been utilizing as a food source. Um, what we get now in our markets, you know, kind of what you'll find at the grocery store, food, you know, natural food markets, uh, are typically going to be either European or Chinese chestnuts. So that's these ones here? Correct. Okay. Uh, Chinese chestnuts are resistant to chestnut blight. European chestnuts, you can see, are a heck of a lot bigger. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the chestnut nut inside is actually kind of soft. You really have to process it to to eat it. It's not like you just crack it and it pops out. You know, it's not like eating a cashew or something that's a little that we're, we're more familiar with. Um, and so if you have to score those nuts and either roast them or boil them to get the nut meat out, something that's like three times the size is clearly Much attractive. More worth <laughs> it. Um, yeah, but I will absolutely. say the American species tastes really good. It's very sweet and crunchy if you're lucky enough to get to try them. Um, and from an ecological perspective, if we're like relying on blue jays and squirrels and other wildlife to harvest these nuts and yeah. harvest and cache them and maybe forget about a few of them as part of reintroduction. Um, the American species is a heck of a lot easier for them to, to handle because they can actually carry a few of them at a time. That's great. Thank you so much for joining us. We actually have to wrap up, though I have I learned so much about chestnuts today. I hope one great. day I'll get to try one. <laughs> That's our program for today. Thank you for joining us on Across the Fence. I'm Julie Whitney. Have a good one. Thank you.